so quickly on the Apple II graphics. I learned about low res, and I think I could definitely support it. It's basically a character mode with double the vertical resolution. It's 40 by 48 by 16 colors. I'm not planning to build it as it's not required for Ultima 4. If you know of any great Apple II games that use low res graphics, let me know. I may revisit that decision before I commit to PCB because it's kind of neat and it may be useful for future ports. I might also do a mixed mode with the same caveats. I still need to tweak the resistor ladder to get the colors just right. I picked up these adjustable potentiometers, so I'll probably do some tweaking. Other than that, I'm more or less done with video for now, so I'm going to move on. Okay, so it turns out that Ultima 4 depends on something called the Apple II language card. Apple II Language Card was released in 1979 by Wendell Sander. The card was simple, and as such, multiple clones were released. Microsoft released a language card in 1980. The language card was for the Apple II and the Apple II Plus, and provided an extra 16 kilobytes of RAM, bringing the total addressable RAM to 64 kilobytes. The card was called the Language Card because it was created to support a Pascal language software package. The Apple IIe shipped with the language card functionality built in, making the behavior stock. Ultima 4 uses 8 kilobytes of banked RAM to store map tile data, so we'll need to support it. Okay, so this introduces some problems. My memory map will need to change. I'm close to the Apple II, but not quite. Apple II has devices from C000 to CFFF, a 4K block. My current map has devices from C000 to C0FF, a 256 byte block. I'm going to change my map to match the Apple II, mostly to minimize the code porting required. I'd like to leave as much of the mocking board code unchanged as possible. And I'd also like to make room for the soft switches that occupy the C0 page. I will make one deviation here. The Apple II has C800 to CFFF reserved for card use. I'm not sure what for exactly. I'm going to use that space as RAM. My SD card routines require a 512 byte buffer and I keep a keyboard state buffer that's also 256 bytes. I'll move that out of the main RAM and stash it here. In my current memory map, MS Basic starts at C100 and is 2200 hex bytes long. MS Basic will no longer fit without taking up almost all of the OS ROM space. I would like to keep it, so I'm going to get creative. It took a little while to figure out how the soft switches and the RAM banking work. The clearest documentation I found was Apple II emulator code in GitHub. This made the behavior clear. Basically, it works like this. There's a region between D000 and DFFF, a 4K region. This is typically a ROM region, but can be config configured to have one of two RAM banks. Between E000 and FFFF, the ROM can be replaced with an 8 kilobyte RAM region with no banking. The banking is interesting though. It can support different read-write behavior. For example, the bank can be configured such that if you read from the D000 to FFFF region, it will read from the ROM, but when you write to this region, it will write to the RAM. This is pretty handy. The Ultima 4 code uses this to switch to RAM writing, to read the ROM, and write it to the RAM bank. It then switches to the read RAM mode, and then all of the OS routines are still accessible for reading, but the region is also writable. The read RAM, write RAM behavior is monolithic, in that both the D000 to DFFF region and the E000 to FFFF regions honor the read RAM, write RAM switches together. The regions can't be configured independently. It's also not possible to read from one of the 4K banks and write to the other directly. Okay, so how to implement these memory map changes. I used Logisim Evolution as a design tool again. I modeled the address lines and I've added switches uh, to model the soft switches and the read-write line. I can flip the address line switches and the soft switches and see which chip will be selected, ROM, RAM, or a device. I can also see if A16 lights up, which corresponds to which RAM bank should occupy the D000 to DFFF region. I added a BS switch for basic ROM banking. With the 16 address lines, the read-write line, and the four soft switches, this creates 2 to the 21 possible combinations. That's just north of 2 million. To test the design, I built a test program. The test program copies the logic from the Logisim project. It goes through all of the soft switch combinations for each of the 64K of memory addresses and for each soft switch combination. It tracks the chip enable outputs for each combination. It coalesces the results into the ranges and dumps it to the console. This narrows it down from 2 to the 21 to 143 ranges. I copied those into Excel and inspected them by hand. Once I got the test tool to pass, I copied the data back into the tool and created a mode that would test against the expected results. This makes it possible to tweak the logic in the test app and instantly make sure nothing has regressed. Overall, this approach was pretty useful and I did find and fix a couple of bugs this way. I have uploaded the test tool into the GitHub repo. 
My current addressing logic is implemented in a 22v10 PLD. This is a 90s era programmable logic chip that is like the FPGA's great grandfather. I did think about breaking out the 22v10 into individual ICs. I like the idea of period correct ICs and using individual ICs would put all of the logic into the schematic. It does feel a little bit like cheating. 22v10s do save space, five to six chips, and have proven handy in the past when I wanted to tweak the logic after going to a PCB. I don't feel too bad about using it since my computer uses VGA, which was not an 80s video standard. It's a hybrid, and I'm okay with that. WinCUPL is free software owned by Microchip Technology that takes a PLD file and compiles it into a JED file. The manual is also available online. The JED file can be flashed onto the chip using an EEPROM programmer. In the PLD file, you label the input pins and you label the output pins, and you define the logic between them. WinCUPL also has a simulation feature where you can specify an input file where you set the input pins to a known state, and it will write out to, uh, to a file that fills out what the output pins are. I modified my test tool to generate the WinCUPL input and output test files. This enables me to confirm that the WinCUPL logic matches the test apps logic, which matches the simulation. It may seem like a lot of work, but really validating on the front end will save a lot of time later. Next step will be to flash onto the 22v10, wire it up to the breadboard, update the emulator to match the new memory map, update the software and get it working again in the emulator and then again on the breadboard. I'll also be tweaking the VGA resistors to get the best color. I need to make a correction about the PLL. I have the PLL circuit in the schematics now. When I was creating the schematic, I noticed that the clock divider isn't where I said it was. The clock divider is actually between the VCO output and the phase comparator input. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.